bring violence to the workplace. We had a situation here at a plant out in Liverpool called Eagle Electronics, an uh, incredibly profitable company made parts for the cable industry. And uh, they actually brought in a private investigator in because they said, well, tires were slashed, so we have to interrogate everyone in the plant. And you know, people kind of got the subtle message that if you do this, this is what's going to happen, is that they'll bring, they'll bring the cops in, especially the guy who was a former FBI uh, investigator. 92% uh, of all private sector employers that uh, force employees to attend mandatory closed door meetings against the unions. What they'll do is they'll shut down production. Or if you're in a hospital, they'll basically carve out time out of your schedule so you have to go and watch movies that shows that unions are corrupt, you're not going to get a contract anyway, you'll have to go on strike, it's all about dues and so on and so forth. So for all these times of get back to work, get back to work, wait a minute. You don't have to get back to work now. I've got to show you a movie why unions are bad. Uh, private sector employers have threatened to call the INS, the, the uh, Immigration Naturalization Service, an organizing drive, 852%. A group of workers organized at a hotel in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. The next day, the INS went through. Now, you're trying to tell me that all this time, the employer didn't know that they were employing people who didn't have working papers? Again, it's another way of using repression, keeping workers scared. 51% of all companies had threatened to partially or fully close a plant if the union wins an election. There was a organizing campaign up in the Plattsburgh area, and what the employer did was just simply put up a map of Mexico. Now, the, the workers in that plant, he the employer never said, we're going to move to Mexico, but guess what happened? The drive died because they were so scared that they were going to move the plant to Mexico. The actual companies that, the companies that actually closed their plants after a successful union election is only 1%. In 1998, uh, workers, uh, workers in 1998, one case providing, proving that they had been illegally discriminated for engaging in legal protected union activity was 24,000 workers. One third of all elections in which workers vote to have a union still have no contract after two years of an election. So even after you win, you win the vote, the company basically stalls, installs, installs in order to you never get that first contract, you never get your rights. You never get that, you know, you get to change the terms and conditions of your employment. They just simply spin you into oblivion. Then workers leave, there's interest in the union loss, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, another group of workers are like, hey, we need another election because we want to get rid of the union, we, we just voted in. Usually supported by their, their supervisors and their employers. 71% of the public, 71% um, of the American public saying the laws protect the freedom joys, to join unions are, are important. 71%, I mean, that's amazing is that there's a total disconnect in this country, and part of it's probably the problems of the unions of the AFL-CIO, is that we're not getting our word out on, you know, on the process and what happens to workers. 71% of people saying that, uh, that the law of protecting unions is important. The proportion of the public who knows what happens when they uh, try to join unions is about 35%. So only a third of the public really knows. So our message is not getting out there. And non-union workers who say they want to form a union is 42 million workers. I mean, that's the amazing thing. And so if we were to get all of those 42 million workers, right now we represent 13% of the workforce, we'd represent half the workforce, which is actually higher than at the merger of the AFL and the CIO back in 1955. So what can we do to change this? What can we do to change our workplace and really you know, try to change the repressive nature so you don't have to tolerate a dictatorship, so when you go into the workforce, you have to tolerate this? Well, there's a couple things we're going to need, you need to do. First thing we need to do is we need to band together as the left. The one thing that the right wing figured out, figured out in spades, and you're seeing it today with this freaking Justice Sunday crap, is the fact of the matter is, is that they don't have a message that can resonate with working class people when they concentrate on economics. Because when you talk about do you want to have health care, do you want to have better wages, do you want to be able to provide for your family, the our message resonates with, with workers. And if you go back to um, the 2004 election, uh, if you were a white male and you were a gun owner and you were a union member, you voted two-thirds uh, two of them voted for John Kerry. If you weren't a union member, you voted for George Bush. Uh, even um, in the AFL-CIO started a group called Working America, which is a um, it's kind of a, an outreach canvassing operation to get non-union workers you know, into the AFL-CIO, and they got a lot of the same messages that union members got. 
because 70% of union members voted for Kerry over, over Bush. And these workers, even though they didn't belong to a union, also voted for John Kerry over Bush. So the message, our message gets out there. So how do they reach them? They reach them through things like these hot button issues and through the churches. I mean, that's why they're doing this in a big church in, in Kentucky and broadcasting it. So we need to get our message out there. So, but we need to band together on the left. The, the issues that were just brought up here and earlier today, those issues have to be brought into a larger message. And then we, got, we need to all be working on the same page. I mean, one of the ways I found that was um, in Syracuse, we're trying to put together a broader progressive coalition of groups like the Syracuse Peace Council, the Partnership on the Lake, Peace Action, um, uh, Citizens Campaign for the Environment, the PERV groups, because we need to start speaking with one voice. And it's, it's a tricky task because, in the end, if you look at the right, they're not as monolithic as you may think. They have somehow kept together economic, you know, free traders with religious conservatives, with all sorts of different groups on the right, and they keep them together. The reason they keep them together is because of money. They figured out that if you keep everyone funded, that way you, you keep, you know, you, you can keep things pretty much on a on, on an even keel, and that's how they keep control. Um, so what I would say is, is that for you to really help this to happen, a couple things that's to happen. First off, get involved with the local progressive coalition, whether you're going to stay here in Syracuse or go back to where you're from. Find these groups and, and really start working with groups of different, of different stripes. Labor, you know, the most successful labor organizing isn't when it's just labor. It's when it reaches out to the community. So when labor reaches out to you, reach back and ask labor to do stuff. Now, the other part of it is, is like, we're moving kind of slow in this progressive coalition because we want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Go slow and cut people slack. If there's an issue that um, they can't agree with you on, don't worry about it. Move on and go to that issue that they do agree on. I mean, for example here, when I, when I say the word Tom Delight, what's your reaction? What do you think? Come on. Tom Delight, what do you think? Yeah, well, yeah you're back here. Ooh. Come on, let's hear it. Come on. <laughs> Call him an asshole. Do it, you know, because we all feel the same way. Is there anyone who loves Tom Delay? No, 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 no Tom Delay fans in here. Uh, unless you're with the government and you're spying on us. But I mean, you know, I mean, that's one thing we all agree on. Okay, so we can agree on that. Agree on other things. You know, I mean, one of the best rallies we ever had here is when Newt Gingrich came to town. Yeah, we, we did. We had hundreds of people outside the, uh, the Hotel Syracuse. We had some union bus drivers from PNC who blew their horns and all this. So, I mean, you know, it's powerful when it gets to It scares the shit out of people. The AFL-CIO, after the PACO uh, debacle back in the 80s, that's when the air traffic controllers were fired by Reagan, we had 100,000 people on the mall in, in, in Washington. Didn't make a ripple. 100,000 people. Now, in 1999, 40,000 people took to the streets of Seattle and it was labor and environmentalists and peace groups and all the different groups of the left, and everyone took a collective crap because it was like, holy shit, the left's getting their shit together in this country. So we really have to start working together. And the one challenge I would have to say is that you need to get involved in politics. And I know it's tough because the political parties are bankrupt and they're, I mean, you know, bankrupt and they're whores and it, they're, you know, a lot of them seem ineffectual or they're stupid and everything like that. And it's a messy, messy process. Trust me, tomorrow we're going to pass a living wage ordinance in the city, and let me tell you, it's been a three-year messy mess. It's, I mean, don't just thank me. I mean, thank, thank people like How, uh, Howie Hawkins out there, who's done really a lot of good work, a lot of other people in town. But I mean, it, it's been a messy, messy process for three years. We, you know, we had to basically go take out a city councilor in order to make that happen. So the thing I would say to you is, like, you know, even though they suck. Go find the local Democrat party and push them and be a pain in the ass to them. Use the process against them and take over that party. Because until we have a real left-wing, broad-based coalition in this country to really take it over, we're still going to get our asses kicked by the right. Until we do that, we're going to have conferences like this, and we're going to keep getting our ass kicked until we start doing this stuff, because we need to push the system. What everyone up here has been doing is pushing the system. Or the brother here this morning who spoke on with Dr. DeFear, you have to push a system. But we also have to take power at some point. And we've got to be in the levers of power really driving the agenda. And we've got to have that agenda clearly laid out so that average working class people don't have the time to sit and think about the different theories of things or, or different things. or They're just trying to make their lives or make their way in life. What we need to do is to make sure that at least they know, okay, I can trust these people. 
they know that if, if I put my trust in you and your in, in your